this pandemic was not only unprecedented in the sense that it was by its nature so widespread, the government's response was unprecedented. Never has a government, to my knowledge, shut down the economy and told everybody we're going to put the economy partly on pause because of it. If you are not getting educated about current market conditions, whether you're in finance, accounting, you're in mortgages, you're in title, or obviously you're a real estate professional, you are doing yourself and your clients a disservice. This is the Knowledge Brokers Podcast. I'm Tom Tool, and we have our usual fellow knowledge brokers on here, Byron Lazine and Lisa Chinati. But we've got our first guest and biggest guest for a while. I am super excited about this. We got George Ratu here the chief economist at Keeping Current Matters. He's also spent four years at Realtor.com and 11 at the National Association of Realtors. George, I've just got nothing but gratitude for you being on here. Thank you for coming on. I'm surprised you came on after meeting Byron. That usually doesn't go that way. So that's excellent. <laughs> it was Super a quick interaction, to Todd. It was a very Good. quick interaction. So Smart move. George, it's Smart a move. pleasure to have you. Thanks for jumping on. Thank you. Thank you to, to all of you for the invitation. Good to be here. And, um, and, and you're right, Byron and I met uh, very briefly. The uh, interaction was instantly uh, positive. So, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, little knowledge is a great thing, not a dangerous thing. I, I had the sports jacket on and then I just ran. Once you said yes, I ran away. You know, once George Costanza, you get the yes, you go. That's a good salesman. That, that, a lot of salespeople should listen to that. Get a yes and then stop talking and leave immediately. Good work, Byron. That's right. <laughs> All right, what are we diving into first, Tom? Well, so the, the, the biggest challenge we hear, right, is inventory. And we've seen inventory this past week. It was relatively flat nationally. We saw uh, about 600 new homes come to the market, according to the Housing Wire uh, market tracker that comes out every week by Logan Motoshami. Uh, we saw a decline the previous week. We saw a couple bumps of 8,000 homes the two weeks prior. So, George, how do you see inventory playing out during the rest of the spring market? Is it going to continue to be flat? Is it going to be a little more market-based and up and down? I mean, th this has been the, the constant talking point for agents and consumers that are out there. Tom, that's such a timely question. And to your point, right, you ask an agent – you know, what's going on in the market and their response tends to be, hey, show me a house and I'll sell it. Uh, right. That, that's what what the market is right now. And to your question, I think based on the market trends, what we're seeing is a market in which more or less a lot of people are on a wait and see stance. What do I mean by that? To your point, inventory has been on a yearly basis, at least increasing, but effectively it's fairly flat. And when you look at the key to that, new listings, right? New listings have been still declining through the winter and into spring. And to me, that's such a crucial component. When, when I looked at historical, and I ran analysis on this, historically speaking, March, April, May are the months in which inventory tends to build up, particularly new listings come to market. And that's the key to the successful summer season, which we normally see. Then that builds during the you know, June, July, August, market peaks, and then things retreat. What we've seen really for, for the last few years, and this year is not an exception, new listings tend uh, tended to lag in the spring. And uh, if anything, the, the reason inventory is not dropping off is because the time on market has lengthened somewhat during the, the winter. But as, as, as I look at the spring market right now, I think that the, the fascinating aspect is to hear how many people are expressing surprise, meaning, well, I'm surprised that after eight months of hearing that A, recession is coming right now, and B, market is going to crash right now, neither has happened yet, right? That, that's been the, 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 the big, I think, surprise for a lot of people that here we are, it's May. Um, we're not in a recession. Oh, yes, we could be. At the same time, job market's still strong. And again, baffling to many, demand is still there, right? Buyers, you look at foot traffic, you look at so many metrics, buyers haven't given up. Their big question is, how can I afford a house if I can find one, rather than can I outright afford a house, right? So to me, to your point, just to, to put a, a, a cap on this, I don't yet see inventory bumping up significantly until there's more certainty both for uh, homeowners, right? Because this is where we saw the biggest pullback. 
homeowners, many of whom are trying to trade up, 80%, 80 plus percent of homeowners are also buyers. So many of them can't find necessarily the next home. One, two, and I think you are keenly aware of this, many of them are sitting on a two and a half, three percent mortgage rate and are really trying to run the math hard. What will it take for me to move to a six percent mortgage and on a trade up home? Um, I'm not saying that all of them you know, are going to just refuse to move. Life circumstances sometimes are tremendously compelling, but the math is not a simple one. Knowledge brokers, I already know that you have a strong desire to become a better agent. People all over the internet telling you how to do it. We're actually showing you how to do it. It's on our BAMX platform. Using the code knowledge brokers down below, you can get 10% off the annual subscription. When you do the math on the annual subscription, it's actually less than a cup of coffee a month. What do you get in BAMX? You're getting a course every single month from us, from one of our team members here at BAM. We've got an Instagram course, an objection handling course, scroll stopping course, and next month I've got a lead course coming out. We also have live streams every single month to go deep on your questions and a Facebook community where we post things that you won't see anywhere else. Use the code knowledge brokers down below to get 10% off your BAMX subscription. We show you exactly how to do it. Don't just pontificate on how to do it. I want to get into math, but recession, it, is it coming, George? And if it does come or when it comes, would, what would that do to inventory? That is, um, Byron, such a, a, a big question for me, right? Because we saw last year, Q1, Q2 came, we saw negative growth based on the, uh, the, the BA's uh, report. Financial markets jumped up and down. We're in a recession, right? And when you look generally, let, let's start with, with brief parentheses. A recession generally tends to be declared by the National Bureau of Economic Research. And based mm -hmm. on their definition, yes, it is two quarters of negative growth. Plus, they look at income. They look at uh, business investments. They look at employment. So it's not just the GDP reading. So based on that, it was obvious we were not in a recession. And the ensuing rest of the year sort of highlighted that, you know, when you have over 10 million open jobs uh, and unemployment rate well below 4%, it's hard to say we're in a recession. So now to your question. Um, I'm not discounting the possibility of a recession, um, but I will highlight something important. Most uh, economists, financial market analysts, are simply expecting the one-to-one -one relationship of the Fed hiking uh, the short-term funds rate, leading directly to a recession. Um, the Fed has evolved a lot over time. And so what I'm seeing today's Fed do is using all the tools at its disposal, including what you'd call maybe a psychological tool, what they call forward guidance, what plainly put means, let us telegraph our intentions before we take action. So that way you, can, you have time to uh, react to it, right? So what this Fed is doing deliberately, trying to achieve what they call that soft landing where we can curtail borrowing costs. That's what they're doing with the funds rate. They're trying to make borrowing costs expensive enough that people stop spending as much without necessarily leading to a huge dent in the jobs market and the economy. So along that path, uh, I think the Fed started on, on sort of, you know, uh, the, the back foot last year was where they spent the better part of 2021 saying inflation is transitory, mostly driven by supply chain issues from COVID. Um, and then it, you know, proceeded to dump over five trillion dollars into the economy. And then last year they said, whoops, we have an inflation problem. So my my simple view on this um, I think if we are going to have a recession, it's likely to be in the in the last part of the year. And to me, the, the big question is not a clear cut one. And if you look at forecasts from most people, you'll see that um, is how severe we are still sitting on a massive cushion of homeowner equity. People still have some savings, though not as much as they did during the pandemic. Those can offer quite a bit of a buffer. So can we slow the economy without getting people on unemployment rolls? That is the trillion dollar question. And so far, I'm looking closely and very cautiously every month for signs of that. And like I said, we've been expecting a recession for nine months and we're yet to see one. Doesn't mean it's not around the corner. I'm not sure I believe the Fed that they ultimately want the soft landing because if the job market <laughs> breaks, it makes their job easier. But there's a, there is a tool they're not using, George. I mean, wouldn't applying pressure back on 
Congress to, you know, obviously come up with a, a deal that, you know, circumvents any debt default, you know, let's, let's come up with a deal there and not default on our debt, but wouldn't reducing the amount of money we spend help inflation? They're not using that tool. They won't touch that. I know the fed can't play politics, but doesn't that just seem like common sense advice? You know, if you're running a business and you're getting into a situation where, you know, you're going to default or something, you, you would reduce your spending. Uh, so wouldn't that be a tool that the Fed should lean into right now? Byron, that's a, an excellent question. And I think one that is very valuable, broadly speaking, for the economy and, and really for individually all of us. Uh, but I think that the ball is really in Congress's court. What do I mean by that? Generally, right, it's Congress that uh, that tends to, to, to decide how much money to borrow, right? As, as, as the administration every year puts forward a budget, Congress has to look at it. It's that budget that drives the, the spending at the federal level. Um, and so it's not really the, the Fed's generally job to control spending in the U.S. The Fed is a central bank. Its goal specifically really is to maintain stability and liquidity in the financial system right through its uh, regional Federal Reserve banks and, and to basically keep the banking system liquid. And when you look historically, that was sort of the, the impetus behind the Federal Reserve is to, to ensure that independent somewhat of government spending, that the banking system is liquid. Why? So the economy doesn't crash in these crazy cycles. That being said, the Fed obviously lends to the federal government. That's why it, buy, it buys treasuries. It buys mortgage-backed securities. It, you know, in, in times of crisis like we saw during the pandemic, it lends directly to the business sector. So if we need to see less spending, uh, my view is it, it's at the federal government where we've spent a lot of money. And in, in my view also, when you look at what has caused this huge run-up in inflation this time, right? People looked in 2008, nine that recession when the fed resorted to zero percent interest rates it expanded its balance sheet from you know decades of roughly under a trillion dollars it went up to four and a half trillion in the span of a couple of years and then we spent the next decade wondering where's the inflation why are we not seeing inflation um simply put the way i look at it and it's it's a somewhat more naive approach without being overly academic as long as you and i don't end up with more money in our pockets, there's no way we can buy more stuff, right? So what happened in 08, 09, the Fed indeed pumped a whole lot of money into the banking sector. The government borrowed some of it, but it didn't end up in your pocket or mine. This time in 2020, 2021, through the fiscal stimulus, the government borrowed money and sent it directly to your home and my home. And all of a sudden we collectively found ourselves with a lot more money. And so, in a sense, that's where I delineate the responsibility on, to your point, on, on spending. I do think that we, we spent a lot of money to prop the economy when the government decided to send all of us home and keep us there. So I get why the government chose to then spend money to plug that gap. But then I think the government kept spending money that wasn't necessarily uh, mm. needed at that point in yeah. the economy. So we're, in a sense, paying the price for that. You don't think any of the inflation has, you referenced the, after the banking crisis, all the money and the zero interest rates, are, are we paying a price for that? Is that wrapped up into this inflation or, or you don't believe that that has any impact? It's just the last couple of years where the inflation's got out of control that the money printing specifically the last couple of years. So the uh, the 08 or 09 monetary expansion, right? We, uh, the Fed went from less than a trillion to four and a half that really ended up showing mostly in what you traditionally call your investable asset classes whether it's the stock market uh, real estate particularly commercial real estate right you look back 2010 11 12 a lot of investments were made with really low interest rates both on the residential but especially on the commercial side so we saw some impact from inflation in those asset classes but the kind of inflation we've seen for the last two years right the 40 year high. This one was a, is a sort of one two punch of number one pandemic global supply chain issues, right? Everybody stayed home all over the world. So all of a sudden, uh, ships weren't moving. And if they were moving, they couldn't get offloaded. That absolutely drove some of the inflation early on. You may remember people having a hard time finding everything from recreational goods to 
um, you know, furniture to building supplies. But then on top of that, what we had were the fiscal stimulus payments um, coupled with, and I think to a lesser extent, but important, the fact that suddenly with all of us being home, we didn't have to spend as much money. We were able to save more. So all of those built up this massive capacity to spend more. And naturally, companies which initially were constrained and had to charge more were then joined by a whole bunch of other companies that realized, wait a second, if we don't increase prices, other people are going to increase prices. So even companies that I don't think necessarily were in a position to absolutely have to make up for that naturally took advantage of the, of the economic cycle, any business would. So to me, I do see the pandemic fiscal monetary combination having a much bigger impact um, on on the current inflation beyond just sort of over a decade of zero monetary policy in, in terms of the funds rate. Well, that's a good history lesson going all the way Excellent. back so for, on the on the zero percent interest rates. Thank thank you for going that deep. I I want to touch on. Um, you said something about the math and I like Lisa has about a hundred agents. What, what do you have right now? Lisa on the team. 104. Yeah. 104. Look Ooh. at she's back up over a hundred. Uh, Tom and I, Tom and I, both of our teams are between 40 and 50 to, you know, that's kind of the range that we've been at for our team. So a lot of day-to-day -day agent, uh, you know, concerns about this math, L Lisa, what's the, uh, what's the agent, saying right now in your office about the math problem for that George alluded to where the seller is just like, I'm sitting at two, 3% and where does the math start to make sense? How are you educating the agents? And then, and then George, maybe some advice for all of us, for all the knowledge brokers on, on how we can navigate through the math for consumers that are stuck in this position. Yeah. I think one of the big things that we're really encouraging our agents to chat about with their consumers is looking at arms and buy downs as a short term solution because the mm -hmm. math is brutal, right? We can look at uh, the difference between, you know, a, an upsize payment is more than doubling for us. And in a market with an average price of six fifty, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000, doubling a mortgage is, it's a daunting kind of task to think about, right? So, would love some thoughts and advice about, you know, besides, arms and besides buy downs, what are the, the options that are scripting that we could use to chat with consumers? And I think, I think that uh, George, I think, sorry, just to jump in there. I think mm -hmm. the number is, yeah, 83%. It is 83% of mortgage homes have a rate at or below 5%. Uh, so yeah, what, what's, what should we be doing here, George? Well, I think really, to be honest, I don't think there is a blanket approach that really will work for everybody. And, and maybe that's the tough answer. Uh, it's, it's, you know, akin to I know there's we have generally in this country a perennial question, how do we solve traffic? And I've heard a lot of, uh, of you know, proposals put out. But one of the most most clear eyed was a gentleman, I forget his name, who basically did a lot of research going back centuries. Uh, and pointing out that anytime you have agglomerations of human in cities, the short answer is there is no practical solution to traffic. People will always try to find something, but with something we just have to deal with. Now, I'm not saying that that's exactly what's, what's happening in the real estate market. I'm just saying in the short term, there's not a blanket approach. What do I mean by this? Example, if someone is nearing retirement um, and is in a high cost market and they know they want to move somewhere else for lower cost of living, Think here, someone moving from Boston, San Francisco, New York, to Tennessee, Texas, Florida. Um, even if they have a 3% mortgage right now, but they're moving at a market that's lower cost, they could sell their house, take the equity, and, and have a variety of options, put a higher you know, down payment. And even with a higher rate, their, their monthly payment is still not high. Take the equity, pay cash. So I'm saying, I'm saying this to, to highlight the fact that for a lot of people, there are options beyond just uh, to Lisa's point, to your point. Well, we, you got to do an arm or you got to do a buy down or you got to do something. It really depends on what your uh, life stage is and what your particular financial circumstances are. At the same time, there's no running away from the fact that, you know, you are somewhere in your maybe mid 30s, 40. You have, you know, you, you've got the second or third kid and you're still in a fairly tight three bedroom. You want to move up. That math gets a little 
tighter, especially if you don't want to leave your market, because now you're going to look at a bigger home with a bigger price tag plus um, a, a higher interest rate. And again, here, I think the important thing to remember is people's circumstances are different. What do I mean by that? Some people um, are getting promotions. Uh, when I look at the, the employment data, wages, even in April, rose 4.4% on a yearly basis. Yes, it's still lagging inflation, at least measured by the CPI at, at 4.95, but it's a much better situation than it was eight months ago when that gap was even bigger. So on balance, for some people, those wage increases over the last uh, you know few months uh, or of job promotion could compensate for those higher rates and actually make the math work. But again, these are not, you know, sort of the blanket, hey, if you do this, we're going to solve the market problem today. The, the blanket approach is where agents are getting themselves in a, into trouble. Yes. George, I like how you broke that down into different buckets. A bucket that knowledge brokers should be paying attention to is four out of 10 homeowners, 42% own their house free and clear. So when you're trying to unlock inventory in your market, be aggressive in that bucket, the, the folks that don't have a mortgage. So if you don't have a mortgage now and you have a need or a desire to be in a different home, selling that home and moving your cash over, it's going to make you a lucrative buyer on the other in the negotiation because you're going to have cash. And uh, it's also going to give them one less thing to worry about on putting that home on the market. So I, I got a question for George. Uh, I saw a, um, and when we're talking about mortgage rates here, Steve Harney, who you know, uh, put this tweet out about um, that uh, there was uh, Lance Lambert was putting the spread between the 10-year treasury and mortgage rates on his mortgage rate movement posts. And over the last 50 years, he mentioned the spread averaged 1.72 basis points. Right now, the current spread is 313 basis points, meaning that 30-year rate should be closer to about 5.29% historically. And a, a lot of knowledge brokers, a lot of agents out there that want to try to understand this don't quite get it. And consumers are struggling with this too. And, and I know, Lisa, I'm sure your agents get this. I know mine do. At Byron, same with you on, on our respective teams. Hey, we're going to wait for rates to come back down because they see what the 10 years is doing. How, how do you explain that to consumers in a way that's easy to understand? Because even what we're talking about here requires some knowledge of the market. And we know consumers move every 11, 12 years. Only about 5% of the population is even thinking about making a real estate decision at any given time. So the knowledge broker can take that info and make it simple to understand. How do you recommend doing that for folks? Tom, that's a very, to me, timely question and also very important. Um, and my view on the spread, so without getting particularly theoretical or esoterical, the spread between the two it really is a measure, think of it as a measure of risk in some ways, right? The, the market is trying to account for the risk, both short term, uh, what's happening in financial markets right now in the economy, housing, job market, but also longer term, right? So the, 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 we have 30-year mortgages, but generally the reason they tend to track the 10-year treasury more often than not is because the 10-year, in light of the fact that most consumers tend to their, stay in their homes for about 10 years, right? That's the period at which you as a, as a financial market investor are going to consider the risk of your mortgage-backed security. Uh, so in a sense, what this tells me is currently a lot of the bond market views the risks in the economy and housing as uh, being much, much higher on the downside, which is why you're seeing that spread wider. Um, and so to your point, absolutely, viewed in, in the light of the long-term trajectory, rates should be lower. But at the same time, let's acknowledge the fact that we're coming out of a highly unusual period. Right. A pandemic is not something that happens every five years or even every 10 years, like most recessions tend to. Uh, in addition, this pandemic was not only unprecedented in the sense that it was by its nature so widespread global. But here's the key from my perspective. The government's response was unprecedented. We've had the 1918 you know, pandemic. We've had other viral pandemics even in the 50s in the U.S. And of course, going back centuries. Never has a government, to my knowledge, uh, shut down the economy and told everybody, you know, we're going to, to put, you know, the economy partly on pause um, because of it. Now, I don't necessarily question that decision because the health of 
all of us, our families, our friends, were obviously on the line. And for a lot of people, there are questions. But let's uh, understand that, that there's not a zero cost to that, right? And so coming out of this highly unusual period, it's not surprising that we're trying to get our bearings. Where are we? Where's the economy going? What's happening to the markets? And that's before you even throw in the Fed, um, you know, the supply chain, all the other things. And I say that because I want to remind a lot of people that the uncertainty, the volatility we're experiencing today is not that unusual given the period we've traversed. So back to your question, how do you talk about to people about the, where mortgage rates are? And specifically in terms of the outlook, number one, looking at the 10-year treasury, I think is a good indicator now that a lot of brokers are keenly aware of what's happening sometimes on a daily basis. Number two, understand that where we're seeing mortgage rates right now have been driven there by a combination of factors. Number one, inflation, right? Because all lenders had higher costs. They had to pass those costs through their product. Their product is a loan. Two, the Fed increasing borrowing rates, right? The Fed rate is, is a basis for a lot of things like the prime rate, adjustable rate mortgages, car loans, personal loans, and so on. So that rate going up also pushes things up. My view, when I look at inflation, at least measured by the CPI, the Fed looks at the personal consumption expenditure, the PCE price index. But you go back and you look all the way to the 70s, what you see is mortgage rates tend to, with a lag, follow on the way up inflation. And then again, with a lag, tend to generally follow inflation on the way down. And I look back specifically in 1970, late 70s, and then early 80s. This is where the Fed right now is fully fixated on. Why? Because they, they, they learned during that period when inflation shot up, the Fed initially hiked rates, then put them on pause, only to then watch as, this was late 70s, only to then watch the 1980s inflation shoot up double digits, you know, 14, 15%. And then Paul Volcker came as chairman and decided we're going to kill this thing and, you know, in the process, kill the economy. Mm -hmm. um, so the Fed is saying we're trying to take that lesson and make sure that it's a one and done monetary tightening right now so we don't have that spike. Um, so my view is if the Fed is successful in accomplishing its task and subduing inflation back near 2%, um, we can expect to see mortgage rates begin to, to trend down um, in tandem with a slight lag. Here, my big question is mostly on timing. Is 2% a real realistic number? It's Great kind question. of arbitrary. You know, why isn't three enough? Great question, Byron. And, and, you know, it's something that when you look at the history of Fed decisions, the 2% target was not necessarily an explicit target until I think the early to mid 90s when the Fed actually made it explicit. This is a target. Prior to that, the, number one, the Fed didn't really necessarily telegraph its decisions. It just made them and financial markets reacted sometimes violently to that. Um, it hasn't been until maybe the last couple of decades where the Fed took a more proactive approach, both in terms of communicating what it's trying to achieve. And I think part of this comes from its mandate from Congress to, in addition to, to stability of the banking system, is to have a low inflationary environment coupled with maximum employment, right? And, you know, their economists look at that in various ways, what that means. But to your point, is the 2% target uh, reasonable? The Fed has viewed it as reasonable for, you know, the last 30 years or so. Um, and a lot of that, the reason for it, I mean, why do we want to have inflation in the economy, right? There's a lot of theory around that. The, the basic under, underlying argument is, as long as you have a growing population that's driving a growing economy, inflation is simply a manifestation of more people producing more things. And as a result, prices adjust. That's in a very simple way. So for the Fed, that makes sense. As long as the U.S. population is growing, it still is, and U.S. economy is still growing, then a 2% inflation target seemed reasonable. Um, I, I haven't worked at the Fed. I don't know necessarily what the 2% target's reasoning is. Um, is it reasonable today? Um, my view is if, if that's been the target we've wanted to achieve and it's in line with economic condition, I don't see a problem with it. Can it be three and we still be just as fine? I can see the value of that too. So what I, I'm not as clear on, the, the, the Fed seems to be indicating it's aiming for 2%. Will they be happy with two and a half percent? My instinct would be to say very likely. The, the, the trick is, right, sensitivity analysis wise, 
uh, what is that zone? I mean, what's the difference between 2.5 and 2.8, 2.5 and, and 3 for the Fed? That I don't know. There are some that believe we're already in the threes on inflation. Barry Sternlight, the CEO of Starwood Capital, they control about 125,000 doors across America. He says rents have already come down. They've been coming down. Uh, you know, rents.com, apartments.com would validate that stance that he has on rent prices coming down. Um, and so he thinks when you suck that out, that, you know, shelter out of inflation that we're already in the threes. Do you agree with that or no? Well, when you look at the both the CPI or the PCE, it is true that cost of shelter, rent or for, for homeowners, the imputed rent, uh, makes up you know a significant chunk, about 30-35% of that. So from that standpoint, we may be on the on the rent side close to that. The rest of those indices, however, is still uh, chugging along. When you look at the cost of food, when you look at um, you know cost for clothing, services, medical device, you name it, in uh, quite a few of those instances, the pr prices are still rising. And so in a sense, if it's simply the cost of shelter, we could say you know the Fed has you know room to to relax a bit. I think for the Fed is the, the full picture. I mean, it's no surprise, and, and I think you're keenly aware of that, Byron. Uh, the Fed has taken the direct aim at housing because of you know shelter making such a big chunk of, of uh, inflation. But at the same time, it's not the only thing, in my view, uh, that accounts for it. So I think the Fed would like to see broader uh, slowdown in inflation beyond just those. And the important thing to remember here, a lot of this data is going to be lagged, right? So we won't necessarily see what's happening in rental market today in the CPR PC for another two to three months. So I think this is where expectations, and I think you've noticed that even in the press, several people have called for the Fed to actually take a break and assess if its monetary tightening, given the lag, is already having its desired effect. At the same time, I do see, as I pointed out earlier, a Fed that's keenly aware of trying to avoid repeating the mistakes of the late 70s, 80s. Yeah, and avoid a Volcker. So the, the Fed did take the direct uh, approach to put housing into a recession. Housing went into a recession last year. By definition, is housing still in a recession or have we come out of it? Well, in, in many respects, I look at, you know, beyond just... And I know that the term housing recession became really popular last summer when we started seeing uh, home sales decline for, you know, five straight months. And, we, and we've now seen them, you know, rebound month over so month. So when I look at, I look at sales, I look at prices. So I try to take a full picture view of this and I look at demand importantly, right? In other words, are buyers pulling back either because they are tapped out or because they don't they are spooked they don't have jobs their confidence is not whatever it is when i look at the picture holistically uh it's not to me as clear cut as housing is still in a recession just as it it the the, the argument over the last few months that you know housing is going to crash was as clear cut either um, when, when i look at traffic you know look at showing time look at various metrics of foot traffic at open open houses that's rising it's been rising now for you know three months uh, so it's a clear indicator to me that consumers and and buyers specifically haven't really bowed out of the market Many of them are trying to, as we've talked, do the math, you know, how can I actually afford this house? Um, so that's one aspect. Number two, when I look at the, uh, the pricing and I look at, you know, the difference between the repeat uh, sales indices, you know, CoreLogic, FHFA, where you basically see the, 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 the momentum actually rebound mm -hmm. looking month over month uh, from the winter deaths. Um, there again, I don't see quite the the dire situation that you know we've we've been predicted about. So, short answer to your question: Do I still see a housing recession? Right now, I don't. I see a market or a housing market that's tremendously uh, constrained. It's constrained by the financing environment. It's constrained by the supply issues. But at the same time, it's not a market that's, in my view, anywhere near a a sense of 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 dread and doom, even though I acknowledge that, to your earlier point, we have a lot of agents saying, hey, show me a house 
and I'll sell it because it's hard to find one. Th those are really great points. And when, when you talk about the Fed, um, you know, we've seen 10 straight federal funds rate hikes in the, in the last in the last few meetings. We've got another meeting coming up here in less than a month. And as of today, according to the CME group, who has a FedWatch tool about the likelihood of rates getting raised or staying the same, there's a 58.6% chance, according to their metric, that rates are not increased and a 41% and change chance that rates are increased. We've heard a lot of rhetoric coming from Jerome Powell that people interpret it as this guy wants to crash the housing market. And and that there's, um, you know, that the people, a lot of experts, like you said, uh, wanted them to stop raising rates. And then there's this also seemingly obsession from the Fed of, hey, we want to drive unemployment up, which I don't see how that helps the economy in a lot of ways. What do you think happens with the Fed and what's your take on on their next move here? Because the last meeting, they, they kind of changed their tune. Now I'm seeing some other data based on a lot of metrics that CME Group put together that maybe that's not the case. Where does this go from here? Tom, that I think it's it's a question about which we'll speculate until June fourteenth. Sure. The Fed yes. makes the I, I agree with that. <laughs> so it, it so changes every that. week. That's right. That's right. I mean, you look at incoming data and financial markets. I mean, this is the nature of financial markets. They react to to whatever is happening and key. And I think this is important as we're talking about this. The reactions are directly tied to expectations right if you're an investor you don't invest for today's market you're investing for what you expect to happen in 18 months five years 10 years depending on your time horizon and so you can have great data come out but it missed your expectations and all of a sudden you're going to say oh this is terrible and you see that in stock market you know in stock prices many times companies release great earnings but because they did not meet the expectations of the analysts well stock price drops so that to me is an important context here because I think a lot of that is driving what we're seeing. So for the Fed specifically, my expectation is based on having watched the, the current Fed, having watched Jerome Powell, extremely, extremely mindful in how they communicate. They try to constantly telegraph to the market what we're considering, what we're about to do. And here's some points for that. Number one, the Fed is keenly uh, tuned in to incoming data. They're trying to understand what is happening in the economy, number one. Number two, the Fed also has at its disposal a tool that it started a few years ago called, uh, ago called the Consumer Expectation Survey. The Fed is literally asking consumers, what do you expect prices and inflation to be like in, you know, in the next few months? And the reason the Fed started doing that is because it realized exactly the point I was making, that many times people have expectations of the future and then they have their actions today. And sometimes those are aligned, sometimes they're not. So Fed is looking at what consumers expect of inflation as well, because it informs them of what consumers might be doing based on those expectations. Uh, so I, th I think that's a, that's a second uh, important aspect. And three, as I mentioned, I do see a Fed that's committed to making sure that it doesn't repeat the, the mistakes we saw again back in the late 70s, early 80s. So if anything, I think the Fed is more likely to continue making small rate increases until it feels absolutely certain that inflation is on a downward glide path towards that 2% target, uh, even if it means potentially a, a recession and some job losses. And I think that that's where maybe I disagree with some observers who say, well, the Fed is done, uh, you know, the numbers are good, we're on the right path. This has been a Fed, and to your point about Jerome Powell, Jerome Powell has been very clear in saying our target is that 2% and we're willing to sustain some pain in the economy to achieve it. Now, there are political pressures, there are circumstances that can change. So naturally, the, the Fed, you know, can adjust. So I'm not saying that, well, you know, the, the Fed is, you know, there's only one path. But this has been the tone that I've been paying very close attention to, and I've seen the Fed also say. So while the, the last meeting, Jerome Powell said um, that a, a pause in monetary tightening may be appropriate, he left the door open to watching incoming data, watching what happens in the economy, to say, it, it, we, I'm not saying we're actually done hiking. I'm just saying we're paying attention. So that that's my, I, I think there's more nuance to this, even though it's naturally we all crave sort of the black and white 
you know, clarity in the outlook. I think that there's there's a lot of nuance in what the, the Fed is looking at and and trying to achieve. Well, I mean, it, it's a complicated market. And, you know, I mean, you look at what the government did prior to all this. You talked about the pandemic. I mean, where they put so much cash into the system and now we're, we're kind of paying the bill, so to speak, for that. I, I think there's a, there's a lot that has to happen here. So um, where do I mean, so it, it sounds like it's TBD. We have to monitor things. I totally get that. And I'm in agreement. Um, do you feel like that the Fed is doing – should they let the markets play out more? Should they give it a little more time? Because I, a lot of experts have called for, hey, like, let's give it a month. Let's not – let's well, let's just take a break this month and see what happens because every piece of data is getting reacted to, to your point. Should they let the market play out or, or do you feel they – I mean, obviously, the data is going to be the data. I don't uh, – but it's sh- – should they let it breathe a little bit here, I guess, is my question. Tom, I think that's an important question uh, and one that – in many ways, exactly to your point, it's quite complex. And to to bring a point you made earlier, and I think it's very relevant, why the Fed is so fixated on the employment market and wages is because in, in, in the Fed's view, as long as wage growth remains strong, it means, simply put, that we as consumers have more money in our pockets and are therefore able, not just willing, to pay more. So the Fed views curtailing wage growth or even pushing some job losses is going to ensure that we're not going to have money on the income side to to pay more for for products so that's going to cut demand because on the other side i mean realistically the the only two main ways that we as consumers can spend based off of one is income we earn income two is we borrow on the borrow side the fed has been you know driving those rates higher so it's already you, you look at, you know, credit card debt, mortgage debt, auto loan, so on. We, a lot of consumers are basically reaching the limit. I mean, rec- record high levels of debt. Now the Fed is trying to squeeze the income side to make sure that the heat comes out of, of prices. Um, and so for the Fed, the fact that the job market is still strong uh, is an indicator that its job may not be done yet. So to your point, should the Fed take a break? I mean, the Fed probably has a certain degree of luxury or maybe a month or two uh, to see what the economy does. I think what the Fed is concerned realistically and you know might not necessarily come out and say that way is financial and capital markets make decisions based on expectation as we just chatted. So if they see the Fed taking a break, they might celebrate that as a hey, it's an all clear signal we're out of the woods. Um, the economy is fine, everything's fine, we can run forward and then capital begins to get allocated. Uh, differently, which might fuel some more, you know, activity uh, and, and continue driving prices higher. So I think for the Fed, that's an uh, it's what it, in essence is trying to tell financial markets is, uh, don't start the party, don't get exuberant. Uh, even if we're not in a recession, we're going to keep at this until we're confident that we're not going to have another flare up. Yeah. So talking prices, let's shift over to home prices here. This pod comes out on Fridays. George. And so a lot of agents will uh, listen to this Friday afternoon or into the weekend as they're getting into their, you know, Saturday and Sunday of showings and meetings and appointments with consumers. And I don't know what happened to Lisa, but I'd love, I would have loved her thoughts on this one as well. Over the weekend, agents are going to hear the same concern from buyers. Uh, Am I overpaying for this purchase, right? I'm going to make an offer Sunday night or or into Monday, a lot of deadlines right now on homes that have multiple offers have a Monday night deadline. You've got a Friday new listing, you've got a Saturday, Mm -hmm. Sunday open house and a Monday night deadline. And as they contemplate Sunday afternoon with their agent and into Monday morning before they finalize that offer and send it in, the big fear from consumers is, am I overpaying? What advice should knowledge brokers be delivering to those home shoppers who have that fear? That's such an important question, Byron. I'm, I'm glad you're asking it that way because I think that is exactly the main question for most people today. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention a, a few things on this. Number one, let's start with whenever you say, am I overpaying or am I paying more than this is worth? You got to have a baseline, right? So what is your baseline? And I think for most people, naturally, the baseline is 2008, or I should say 2006 
to 2010, right? The, 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 the first time we experienced collectively as a country a huge uh, decline in both transactions and prices. And that's not that far in the past, so it's fresh for most people. And so naturally, they'll refer to that period when saying, am I paying, am I paying today like people did in 05, 06, only to end up with a house that's devalued? Um, and in terms of market fundamentals, uh, at very least, who are not in the same boat. 2003 through 2006, we saw a tremendous amount of overbuilding. And that's in addition to all the financial market you know, aspect where we saw the no doc, no income, no assets, no mm -hmm. job. Those kind of loans, they're no longer here. Uh, FICO scores record high. Underwriting, if anything, underwriting has been extremely disciplined and if in fact almost maybe too tight in you know the last 10 years or so so that is already different now the other thing i'll, I'll, I'll mention because i think is important whenever you worry am i going to overpay for this house the big question is over what time horizon because that's important right if you bought in 2000 uh and if you you had to sell in 2007 2008 it's very likely you still had some degree of equity now I remember shopping for a house in those years, and I, I, I looked at homes that owners bought in 2005, 2007, and were trying to sell them in 2010. Yeah, they took a huge, huge loss on that. That's why I think time horizon matters. And for, for buyers, and especially for agents as they talk to buyers, uh, this is something that's very important to, to get clarity on, particularly for buyers. How long do you expect to live in your house? Because if you expect to live in your house for the next year or two, maybe you are overpaying. Not so much on the outright value of the home, but think about the fact that buying and selling a house has transaction costs. So if you don't think your job is going to be as stable in the next two years, if you plan to move in the next two years, maybe you should think a little bit about what you're paying because you're not necessarily going to come ahead. If you're going to be in your house five years or longer, on the other hand, um, it's a very different time horizon. So the third item I'll add to this, and I think this is so important, particularly for buyers' confidence, and agents know this and understand it, but I think it's worth reiterating. We're in an, an environment in which the market is not temporarily or momentarily undersupplied. We are structurally underbuilt. And I say that because when I look over the last 10, 15, 20 years, the United States has grown in population, the household formation numbers, right? People striking out on their own after college, people getting married and starting a new household. Those have not only rebounded from the last recession in 2008 or 9, but have actually grown tremendously. What hasn't happened over this period has been enough new construction. And so by, by various calculations, we are underbuilt, you know, from anywhere to like two and a half million to possibly five million new homes. What that means is there are more people wanting to buy homes than there are actually homes in the market. And it's not just because of the pandemic and because low interest rates and all the temporary issues. It's a fact we have not built enough homes for the population growth. As a result, if you're buying a home today, um, even if builders you know, double the volume of new homes that they're building, and they're not, your your market balance is not going to be in an overbuilt situation for a long time. So long answer to say, yes, it feels like we're paying, you know, a, a lot of money for homes today. And compared to three years ago, yes, it's a lot of money. At the same time, the market dynamics are different in that way. And we need a lot more new construction just to bring us in an equilibrium state, let alone one in which we, we can worry about an outright uh, massive decline in prices. Yeah. I think Lisa was uh, waiting for an important call, by the way. And so she yes. may, may or not join us back. I have one last question, and then I, I don't know what Tom will want to finish with. Mine's about the affordable housing. So yes, we have a shortage of uh, new homes, and you mentioned that. And we keep saying we need to build more homes, build more homes. The average sale price in this country right now on new homes is over $550,000. The median sale price on new homes is over $450,000. So if we keep saying we need to build more homes, build more homes, and we build more of those, I don't believe we're going to meet the demand of affordable options for home shoppers today. It's why you see 20, 30, 40 offers 
on a $350,000 home, which is more in line with median pricing across the country. I've got my thoughts on how to bring more affordable homes to the market. You stimulate the top and you stop the stimulation of the bottom crap where you you give somebody a great closing cost who's a home shopper who's just competing on those $300,000 homes. You maybe stimulate the builder by saying, we're going to take regulation out in mm-hmm. the trade-off that you build you know, single unit product at a particular price point. But I'd love your opinion, George. How, how can we get more new homes that are affordable into the market today. And Byron, I think you're on the money. And, and to, to give some perspective, it wasn't that long ago. And by that long ago, I mean late 90s, even 2000s, um, when, and, and I make that distinction because from that point going backwards all the way to 1950s, we had the same market and here i'm going to describe it to you it was a market in which along with existing homes new homes were available for every price range and wallet we're talking you know going back in time to the sears home they got shipped to your you know property on a truck right i've sold a couple of those yeah well there you go you you've seen them right so which were really low priced to the Plan subdivisions where you can have an entry level, mid level, um, upper level home, all the way to the luxury custom products. And again, if you look back late 90s, early 2000s, that was still the case, right? You could find entry level homes in parts of the country. I'm th- thinking here, you know, affordable Midwest, uh, the South, um, Ohio, Tennessee, Kentucky, those parts. You could find an entry level brand new home for less than $100,000. Um, granted, we're not in that environment, but what we saw post Great Recession was an environment in which the entry level new home or even the mid level new home absolutely disappeared from the map. Some of that, and to, to your point, right, some of that is down to regulations. Uh, the fact that zoning, by and large, in a lot of communities across the country, zoning regulations are still stuck in a 1960s, 1970s period a very different America than what we have today. And they haven't really, uh, you know, been changed to reflect the change in the economy, the changing times, the changing preferences. Um, so changing some of those already is likely to yield more, uh, more productivity. And we're seeing, you know, California has increased some of its density. The, the, the bottom line here is minus some geographic restrictions. Think here, Boston, New York, San Francisco, where you have physical boundaries you cannot build out. A lot of communities have space to build. It's just that they, they don't necessarily want to approach it from, from you know, that way today. So to your point, Byron, removing some of that, I think, would, or at least adjusting it to encourage builders to, to be able to leverage lower costs, at least during the permitting and development process, could lower the price of a new house. Uh, in addition to that, and I think importantly, the uh, cost of construction are also fairly variable. I mean, I just looked this week, um, you know, Cost of lumber, just raw lumber, thousand square, thousand board feet of lumber, three hundred and forty-four dollars. Before the pandemic, they were running about the same range. During the pandemic, naturally, we saw them shoot up to thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars per thousand board feet. We're away from that reality, so the cost of lumber has come down. Trade routes have reopened. So by and large, um, some of that could be reflected in the final price. I know for builders, they have the labor cost, which those haven't gone down. Um, But at the same time, I'm with you. I think there are several places in which we can make uh, changes, even if at the margin, to actually bring that cost down. And that's before we even get into any technological solutions, right? And I'm thinking here, you look at the 3D printing. Several companies are competing in this space. I think one of them is Icon out of Texas. To me, a huge accomplishment. I, I think it was in the last you know, three, four months when they were able to actually build, I think it was a house in Houston, and end up putting a second story, right? So the limitation on the concrete, the technique was they could only build one stories. Now they're trying to push the boundary of that technology uh, forward. So I do think that some of these are also important to leverage in the construction process in a way that lowers that cost. Uh, bottom line, here's here's the way I look at it, you know, uh, Byron. Uh, we have had the blessing of a growing population which has grown our economy. 
At the same time, we've covered our eyes and ears during the, the last you know, two, three decades, uh, sort of in denial over the fact that we actually need to build housing to accommodate all these people. Um, so it, right, th this is something that we all have to collectively come to, to terms with, that it's important enough to do something about it. And solutions at that point, I think, will be much more feasible. Become a better agent. Everyone tells you what to do. We actually show you how to do it. That's with our BAM X subscription down below. Make sure you sign up today. We have an event coming up in September. All of our events and creator courses, you get 25% off when you're a BAM X member. You don't want to miss any of these upcoming events. And in the meantime, we're uploading new BAM courses every single month from our BAM team that you have instant access to along with the live streams. Sign up for BAM X today so you can become a better agent. Yeah, we wrote about one of those 3D homes. This was in Long Island on nowbam.com. It was a 2,000 square foot home, uh, four bedroom. Dan O'Neill had the listing and handsome home buyer was in partnership with four or with SQ4D to create it. That can bring costs down. This particular home sold for just shy of 500,000, um, you know, because they put it on the active market, competitive market. So it, it didn't solve the problem of affordability. But to your point, you make deals with builders where we're, we're going to let you build here. Maybe let's lower the construction cost with 3D. Let's remove regulation, but only on the trade-off of pricing at a, in a certain category. Tom, any final thoughts for George, who's uh, been very gracious with his time? Yeah, I, I love the conversation about affordable housing. We spoke about this last week, and Robert Dietz, the chief economist of the National Association of Home Builders, you know, talked about the regulatory costs. So I think that's a really uh, relevant point at NAR's meetings. Um, the, you know, you mentioned zoning, and you know where, where we are here, right outside Philadelphia. And you know, my, my father sold thousands of new homes in, in the time you talked about, and I'm like single family homes for a hundred fifty thousand dollars. Now they're worth obviously much more. So I've got a unique perspective there. How do you deal with the zoning regulations? Because some of these townships and some of these municipalities, they've got very old school governments. And uh, the incentive side is great that Byron's talking about. I love that. Some of these places have just a, they, they do things a certain way because that's always how they've been done. And they're, they don't want to give up the, the green grass in their communities. They don't want to allow for these townhomes or smaller single family homes to come in. They got minimum lot sizes of an acre in some places. And that's, this is literally right outside my office. How, how does that, I don't want to call it disruption. How, how do you make headway in talking to these local governments? Because to me, that's going to be the biggest roadblock here. I think the tax side can, can work from a state level or, or a federal level. And, you know, even maybe doing something with the capital gains tax exemptions is another way you could look at stimulating the top for some of these people sitting on a ton of equity and they've got a big capital gains tax coming. How do, how, do, how do you actually go about penetrating these markets where you want to deregulate? Because that, in theory, it sounds great. I've seen this happen where township meetings go till 4 a.m. So what, what would, what, 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 what's your opinion on that? I don't even know people what? stay up till 4 a.m. in Pennsylvania. Go ahead, I, George. <laughs> there were some old people too, Byron. It was not, this was not the young bucks here. No. Hey, when people when people feel strongly about something, you know, whether it's a rave party, I don't think there are many of those. Or if it's a town hall meeting, I think they're going to stay up as late as it takes. George, are you a raver? Are you a raver back in your day? Uh, not exactly. Not not exactly. <laughs> I, I, I'm just aware that they were happening. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Richmond doesn't sound like a place where there's a lot of raves. I, I, not, I have not found them if they are anywhere near here. <laughs> West Bill um, Harney. I bet he knows. Yeah, oh, that's true. Yeah. The I'll young, to, the young pick his brain. <laughs> so, so Don, to your, to your question, I think is such an important one. Um, I think the answer here is, is again, not a one size fits all. So I'll start with that because I think that's important. Number two and equally important. I think for a lot of, of, of people, a lot of communities, the real concern is that what they are seeing on TV, in the papers, in the news, generally tends to be confined to a pretty narrow set of examples, right? They hear high density and they see footage of Manhattan, they see footage of Boston, and they think, well, their suburban community, to your point, you know, with one acre lots, it's going to become, you know, a downtown area. Um, and the trouble in, from my standpoint here is one of available models. A lot of people are not aware of successful mixed use or higher density suburban developments over the last decade, decade and a half. Um, 
And so as a result, because they don't have that model, they just assume that it's got to be terrible. And I say that because to me, one of the most exciting things I've watched over the last decade was this, this um, uh, really emergence of what I call the suburban downtown. Right? There are markets all over the country where developers came together with municipalities and said, listen, we want to create in the suburban environment a higher density um, landscape. And what you see are these mid, mid-rise office condos uh, interspersed with retail green spaces, transit lines and, and, and you know, uh, bike paths, you name it, all in an environment that, number one, remains extremely aesthetically pleasing. Number two, preserves the quality of life of the people in there, doesn't detract from it. And number three, and I think importantly, it allows a lot more people to live in a, a smaller footprint. And again, key here is without necessarily detracting from the quality of life. So now to your to your specific question, can we ask the you know a community with one acre lots to to agree to split their lots if they want to and build, you know, a fourplex or a six unit apartment on two lots, that might be a harder sell, right? Partly because this is what they're envisioning. Could, could someone put a duplex uh, and still maintain the quality of the neighborhood? Absolutely. I mean, you can have architectural standards put in yes. place that don't detract from it. So there are so many details in which you can achieve something uh you know like who you know, do you want to take the historical nature of downtown philly raise it and put nothing but glass skyscrapers in some of the history probably not right um so at the same time when you look at and i'm using downtown philly mostly because you know it's 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 right there in 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 pennsylvania you look at downtown downtown has evolved over time while still maintaining a historic aspect a modern aspect and, and an aspect in which a lot of people have found the downtown living a lot more rejuvenating. And I'm not advocating we all create downtowns all over suburbia. All that to say, I think that there are ways in which, to your point, size lots matter. And, and what's the use of having, you know, a, a, a small lot if you're going to have a 6,000 square foot home on it that's going to be <laughs> nose to nose with your neighbor? That doesn't help either, right? We got plenty um, of those. The, that's right. That's right. But in, in, you know, to your question, I think that here communities could be, if they if they, they really approach this in a constructive way, meaning how can we move forward rather than uh, I don't want to hear about any, you know, high density and, and, you know, lots of condos showing up in my neighborhood. I think that nobody's advocating we put condos everywhere. Uh, but at the same time, to your point, I do think that some of this reluctance is simply due to the fact people have not seen enough successful mixed use developments that don't detract from a, the aesthetics or the quality of life. And key, I guess, for a lot of uh, residents, they don't detract from values. In fact, a lot of neighborhoods that have existed and where these mixed use developments sprang up have actually seen their values rise. Because yes. whether it's Whole Foods that showed up you yes. know, in part of this, whether it's some retail store, you name it, whatever it is, showed up and all of a sudden, whoa, hey, our neighborhood is now in the cool, vibey part of town. And having a standard is a good thing. I, that's why I like living in HOAs. Be, I don't want to live next door to the one acre lot who decides to put three broken down cars in his front yard. It's not appealing to me. And so I like to live around in a community that has a standard and a guideline and you can accomplish what you're saying by doing that. I, I love that approach, George. So I, I don't know, uh, Tom, We I think... I think we covered, covered a lot all. of the bases. This was super thorough. And George, I, I, I'm just, it's the first time we're getting to uh, chat here. Floored by your opinion on this stuff. I think, I think it's everyone and the knowledge brokers, especially I'd be saving this, leave us a comment. Let us know what you think of George on, on, on the pod here. This is something I'd listen to three or four times. And the way you explain things made it super easy for even guys like me to understand. That's so right. I, I think this is really, really important here that, you're able to communicate this, especially the knowledge brokers, to your clients and consumers because it's way easy to get stuck in the jargon. And you explained everything perfectly that literally everybody can understand. I'm, I'm uh, you know, really grateful for you coming on here. I have a couple pages of notes, but even though I got, got to hear this firsthand, I'll be giving it a re-listen as well. George, I'd be we'd be super grateful if you consider a part two maybe later in the year as we head into 2024. We'd love to have you back on at some point. Sounds great. Glad to join you. 
That's Appreciate a yes. it, George. That is a yes. We, I mean, that's why we get it. Uh, you know, before we end the recording, George, so you can't, you can't turn back on it. <laughs> that's right. The sales it's, it's background on, that we both have page. here. And now we, now we, George Costanza. Let us know in the comments, knowledge brokers, what you thought. I thought this was the best pod yet. George, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate the invitation, both uh, to you, Tom, and, and Byron. And uh, it was great to also see Lisa. We'll, we'll see her on the full one next time. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone.